Robertson's family and friends. Good afternoon and welcome to the long-awaited and much-anticipated grand opening of Rushi's campus. Last week Friday marked our family's 19th anniversary of immigration to this great country and fantastic city. And this Wednesday, Purim, please God, we will celebrate the anniversary of our introduction to Rabbi Hershey and Rashi, as well as at the time, the very limited yet warm and welcoming community here at the Chabad of North Fulton. For our family, as like many of yours, it was the beginning of a journey that has guided our lives, kept us firmly grounded in our Yiddishkeit, and allowed us to thrive, both Jewishly and secularly, in suburban America in the 21st century. I share this tidbit of personal anecdotal history with you, or as we now say, with all of you all, because I believe that the Shapiro family is a micro example of the hundreds of families who now share our experience and our history. Every member of our community came here looking for an authentic Jewish experience. Whether it was a synagogue to pray, summer, summer camp for your kids, Hebrew school, educational classes, or perhaps spiritual guidance. Or if you were like the Lost Shapiro clan, all of the above. And in all probabilities, you, like us, were successful at finding what you were ultimately seeking. This building is not only a realization of a dream for our now much larger community, Baruch Hashem, but should also serve as a beacon of hope and trust for all those that aspire to greatness. It is my belief that the completion of this building is based upon what our sages teach us that the foundation of Torah and Jewish belief is of us Yisrael, love of your fellow man. Our community, and by extension this campus, and shul, is testament to the fact that if one is loving, kind, helpful, respectful, and seek no ulterior motive except to make this world, which is God's creation, a better place for all, then with hard work, perseverance, personal sacrifice, and surrounded by a supportive team, one can and will succeed in all of their life's endeavors. This magnificent edifice comes to fruition from a more than 10-year dream, ignited perhaps from the untimely and heart-wrenching loss of our dear Robertson five years ago today. Her dedication, love, and commitment to her family and community is etched in every spectacular detail of this building which will now carry her name for eternity. My personal wish that I'm sure is shared by all is that Rabbi Hershey and Rashi's children will appreciate and grasp what can be achieved through love and dedication. Mendel's hopes, prayers and wishes together with his innocence of youth gave this campaign a boost of reality and his dream of having a Jewish center in his dear mother's name today has been realized. <laughs> Mendel, Yoli, Henya, Tanya, Tali, Shia, David, and of course Alta, your mother no doubt looks down on all of you today, her beautiful children, and smiles, basking in her success. The list of thank yous for this project is gratefully very long. Every single member of this community has contributed in some way, shape or form. Every donation has been matched by a volunteer's hard work and we hope that each of you enjoys that same sense of pride in this accomplishment. To single out individuals would therefore be a recipe for disaster, for fear of omission. But I would be remiss in my duties if I did not mention the many years, hundreds, if not thousands of hours of painstaking work 
graciously provided by the humblest and talented of men, Ari Khan of Ari Khan Architects. Ari has overseen every minute detail of this building, from the initial drawings seven or eight years ago, to the last coat of paint seven or eight days ago, and many, many details in between. We are absolutely delighted to be a part of what surely is his magnus opus, the masterpiece of his unbelievable and wonderful career. Ari, no words can express our gratitude. Thank you. We would also like to thank our general contractor, J.K. Lockwood, and their many subcontractors. for their patience and atten attention to detail in completing this project. And two other specific references of gratitude must be made. To my friends who are always willing to go that extra mile and always smiling, Todd and Gabriella Starr, who, who co-chaired the fundraising campaign. And to my good friend and running partner, albeit a little unreliable, <laughs> Cradle Craig Isaacs, who has overseen the finances of the campaign and the building so very diligently. Thank you to all of you. <laughs> Leadership, no doubt, is crucial in building a community, and we are forever grateful to Rabbi Dov Bear and Devorah Leah Thaler for their hard work, love, and devotion to our community. And we reiterate our abundant wishes for their continued success and happiness. Our future is bright and the possibilities are endless with the leadership that guides us today. The indomitable Rabbi Gedalia Hertz and Ruthie, they continue to inspire us with their boundless energy. Youth programming and educational programs have reached new heights and we could not be more excited to share our future with them and their wonderful family. It goes without saying, that sans the leadership and dedication of Rabbi Minkowitz, we would not be standing here today. <laughs> Truly, it would take as long as it did to build this building for me to try and encapsulate all that he has done and continues to do. Suffice it me to say that I believe everyone present here today thinks that they have a personal and special relationship with him and they would be correct. I think that says it all. To be able to connect with hundreds of Jews from all walks of life, inspire, lead, and guide them without any sense of judgment is a God-given gift. Sometimes in life, you are at the right place at the right time, and we all share that serendipitous sense when we consider our fortune in being matched with Rabbi Hershey. This building is a witness of his love, dedication, wonderful sense of humor, and unbelievable courage as a rabbi, father, friend, and colleague. I know we are all united in our prayers and hopes for his continued success and happiness as our spiritual and community leader. There is very little doubt that the completion of this, of this Jewish center will forever change the spiritual landscape of Jewish life in North Fulton County. I urge you all to continue to support, but more importantly, to take advantage of all that Rashi's campus and Chabad of North Fulton has to offer. May our community continue to grow from strength to strength and I hope that you all have a wonderful day here today and enjoy what we have to offer forever. Today's program will consist of a few short speeches, whereafter we will have a procession carrying the tourists to the new building. I'll ask you all to please follow the procession and try not to enter or don't enter the building through any of the other access points because at the entrance to the building there's going to be a, rib a ribbon cutting ceremony. Thereafter, with song and dance, we're going to march the sacred Torahs to their new home in the Aron Kodesh. 
Everybody will then be invited to enjoy a magnificent lunch. You can schmooze, enjoy the building. The mikveh and the swimming pool will be open at that time for guided tours for whomever would like to see them. Um, for the children in the classroom, there will be art activities and there's a jumping castle um, outside. So without further ado, it is now my distinct honor to invite to the podium, representing Chabad World Headquarters, Chairman of the Annual Kinners Convention, Vice Chairman of Mercus, the outreach arm of Chabad Lubavitch International, Rabbi Moshe Kutlaski. Rabbi and Mrs. Minkowitz Sr., Rabbi and Mrs. Lieberman, Rabbi Nu, family Shluchim, and above all, the children of Rabbi and Rashi and the, and the community. In the name of Lubavitch World Headquarters and Shluchim around the world, I have come today to express the feelings of the world of Shluchim and the Lubavitch community, one of amazement. I've been through many, I've been by many openings of many Chabad houses and I can safely say that this is one of the most beautiful Chabad houses I have ever seen. Yeah. Hershey, you don't cease to amaze me. You always, from the day that I remember you from when you were, you know, the first time I was in Georgia was 49 years ago. So it's a long time. But I remember Rabbi Hershey when he was a child and so many others. I, I just, you know, I choke up. I take a look at your beautiful family and I say to myself that so many others would have found so many excuses facing challenges. And look at this beautiful family that you have. Look at what you accomplished. Look at the community that loves you and loves your family. And look how Rashi is definitely sitting with Shep Nachas. And if she is Shepping Nachas, you could imagine the Nachas that the Rebbe has from such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful enclave and such a beautiful, beautiful community. David should give you strength. You should be able to continue. And I want to say a word to the community. The first Chabad house was the tabernacle that was built in the desert by Moshe Rabbeinu. It had components to it. The first component was the ark. It was gold on the inside and gold on the outside. Why gold on the inside and gold on the outside? Because just as this community, it's a community which not only learns Torah, but practices it. Because it isn't enough only to teach, to learn. It is also has to come and show itself in the daily practice. The second component was the shulchan, the table with 12 loaves of hot bread. Rashi's hospitality was legendary and this is being continued today. The third is the menorah, which was a light on the inside and a light to the outside world. The light here is a beautiful light on the inside of the community, but seeing the mayors of the communities, or the surrounding communities, and these communities, you could see that it is also a shining light to the communities around. Then there was the, the altars. There was an altar of Adam, of built of earth, Adam, of built of earth, but means people that gave of themselves. And there was the Mizbeah Chazov, those that the golden altar which means people that give of their possessions and that is you when the mishkan was finished we find something as follows Moshe Rabbeinu stands up and he says Moshe. Moshe blessed them what was the blessing that Moses blessed them he said may it be the will that the divine presence should rest in the works of your hands and the question is asked, when you need a blessing from the rabbi, when do you go? When you're going out to make a fundraising campaign. You go, you ask a rabbi for a blessing. No blessing for Moses. Keeps quiet. 
The architect has to build it, has to plan it, it should come in on time, under cost. No blessing. People brought, it was the only time in history, you won't find Rabbi Hirschi or any other rabbis here, that will come and tell you that we have enough money. By the building of the tabernacle, they said, but hey, it was enough. We don't need any more. Everybody brought everything. So the Jews come and say to Moses, they said, we don't understand. The Almighty God said, build me a sanctuary, I'll dwell amongst you. Amongst each and every one of you, I'll dwell there. And now all of a sudden, everything is standing, everything is built on the cost. We brought enough money, everything is there. And all of a sudden, Maishu Rabbeinu gives a blessing. What's the blessing? May it be the will that the Divine Presence should rest amongst the works of your hands. Jews said, we don't understand. You said, build me the sanctuary while I dwell here. We did it. Now come. We, now it should, we have to come. May it be the will. And the answer to that is, Moses wasn't talking about God. Moses was talking to the people of Israel. And he said to them, it's true, you built a beautiful Rashi campus. You built a beautiful tabernacle. You did something so magnificent. Now may it be your will that the Divine Presence should rest amongst the works of your hands. Because how will that happen? Through your coming to the classes, through your participating in the prayers, through coming to the social events, to turning this community, which is a beautiful, beautiful community, into something that there isn't one Jew. And this I want to say to Rabbi Hirschi and to the kids. The Rebbe once said there could be 10,000 Jews in your city. You reach 9,999, you get tremendous credit, but your mission you didn't accomplish. If there's one Jew in North Fulton County that isn't coming to the Chabad house, then the mission of Rabbi Hershey and Rashi, Yibodol Chaim Tevim and the children, has not been accomplished. And that is up to each and every one of us here and you to see that this is accomplished. I was in Berlin on the day of V50, almost 50 years ago. Emperors, kings, presidents, vice presidents, prime ministers, chancellors, were all assembled in one room. And the legendary leader of the Jewish community, Ignaz Buvitz of Germany, turns to me and he says, lest we forget, we shouldn't forget. And I turned to him and I said to him, if we're not going to educate the next generation, and we're not going to have centers like this, then Auschwitz, Dachau, Bergen, Belsen, Treblinka, Dachau, six million of the best and the brightest, Sadiq Yelam, the righteous of the generations, little children who knew no sin. It's all going to be in vain. And you're coming here today and showing the support and showing that you are part of this community proves beyond a doubt that those that tried to annihilate us were not successful. Torah lives, Judaism lives, and Am Yisrael Chai, Am Yisrael Chai, Am Yisrael Chai. God should grant each and every one of you all of the blessings. And I want to conclude with, it's actually something that I heard in the South many, many years ago from a Jew with a long white beard in a non-kosher nursing home. Where I came in, I heard he was there, and he came, I came in and he said, my children dump me here. They don't even visit me on Father's Day. But he had one prized possession, a picture that he had of his children, grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. And he said to me, Rebbe, what should I say? He spoke a beautiful Lithuanian Yiddish. He said, my grandfather used to call it the Hele Kishavis Kodesh, the Holy, Holy Sabbath. My father called it the Holy Shabbos. I call it Shabbat. My son calls it Saturday. My grandchild calls it the weekend. He says, I give a shiver when I think what my great-grandchild is going to call it. And in America, they have a name for it today. They call it the day before Super Bowl Sunday. It is up to each and every one of us. The Rebbe told us this is the last generation of exile, be the first generation of the redemption. It's up to us to see that everybody experiences one Shabbos here, so we'll merit the true redemption. Rabbi Hershey, children, I think the last time I was here was by Alta's bris. So, by David's bris. It's been a while. 
It was then in the infant stages. Continue what you're doing. You don't have to change. You don't have to do anything differently. We love you. Your community loves you. Shluchim around the world look up to you. You are our star. And you, the children, you don't know what continuation of your mother's legacy means to all of us. God bless you. The Rebbe is with you. And be successful in everything that you do. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a gripe with uh, Rabbi Hershey. I asked him that I should introduce Rabbi Kutlaski, not follow him. Yeah, especially after I finish speaking. <laughs> On behalf of the 20 Shluchim families here in the state of Georgia, I want to extend a hearty mazel tov to Rabbi Hershey, his children, Rabbi and Mrs. Hertz, and the Chabad of North Fulton community for this newest, and I dare say, most beautiful Chabad house in Georgia. I'm reminded of something I read a few years ago, I believe it was in Reader's Digest. There was a house fire and a house burnt down but thank God all the members of the household survived and a TV station came and interviewed the family and the interviewer asked one of the children tell me what's it like not to have a home anymore and the child looked at his family and he said, I still have a home. I just don't have a house to put it into. And my friends, Chabad of North Fulton has had a home, a spiritual home here for many years, led by the, uh, by the dedication of Rabbi Hershey and Rashi of blessed memory. It was filled with Torah, a love for Yiddishkeit, most importantly, a love for a fellow Jew. But it was housed in trailers. And today, this magnificent, beautiful home, this community of Chabad of North Fulton has a beautiful house to match it. And my blessing is that that home feeling as we say in Yiddish, the Hamishkeit, the warmth of the personality of Rabbi Hershey and his family, the legacy of Rashi, remain and truly permeate this wonderful Chabad house. This week, we will celebrate the festival of Purim. And on Purim, despite the many heroes of the story, the one who stands out and the one who is recognized is Esther. He is referred to as Mikilat Esther, the scroll of Esther. And so too, this campus is aptly named Rashi's campus. The campus word describes the house. Rashi describes the home, the warmth, the dedication, the priorities of family, community, God, Israel. And may you led by our incredible colleague, Rabbi Hershey, may you grow from strength to strength, and may this truly be a beacon of light for North Fulton and beyond. Mazel tov. We're celebrating today the official grand opening of um, really, the, I, I would call it phase two. And the phase one of this whole project is the building behind us. That started 12 years ago. 
and it's the original Poon building. I would encourage you to go look at it later. And to me, it was a test I was given by the rabbi before I was hired to do phase two. He wanted to see if I would perform, and once he liked it, he called me and said, okay, let's go to, next, to the next phase, phase two. And um, let me talk about a little bit about the process of designing this building. We, Rabbi uh, Hershey and, and me, um, toured several Chabad facilities in the United States. And um, I came back with um, what, I, what I say, the, the good, bad, and the ugly. I kind of try to get some input from these uh, existing buildings and learn from them what to do or what not to do. And second, um, the vision that was given to us, or to me, was done by, by uh, Washi, that's the memory. Uh, she's the one that essentially told me what she wanted to see in the building, what functions, and, and so we came up with the first scheme. Um, it took several schemes until we got to what you see today. Um, and, and people ask me today, what really are the principles or what guided me to design this building? Because I'm a secular Jew. I'm used to go to synagogues, but it was not, and my practice is not doing these. I practice something completely different. Um, and I went to study a little bit about Hasidut, which Chabad is part of it. And one of the biggest things that st stood out to me that I could implement in this building was the one of the principles of which is called happiness. And let me kind of quote a little bit um, what Hasidut says about happiness. When people act with happiness, their deeds are whole and successful. Doing from sorrow and misery ends up with poor results. And to invoke the feeling of happiness in the building, I basically implemented two principles that I adopted. One of them was light, and the other one was color. And I hope I did a good job. When, once you walk, <laughs> and interestingly enough, um, there's specific colors have meaning in the Kabbalah. And I know, I would say, I would say nothing. I, I know very little. And everything that I did was done from intuition. And some people say to me, it's because God gave you the power to do what you did. Um, so I, I used colors in the building, not really knowing um, beforehand their actual meaning. And one of the colors is blue. If you walk into the building, there are a lot of blue colors. They have a lot of meaning in Kabbalah. Um, besides, I did not really, designing the building, I did not really look at any features in other similar buildings like that. It was all came to me from either my intuition and as I said, people would say it came to you because God gave you the power to do it. They, let me talk about the unique, the uniqueness about this whole project. Um, it is not like any commercial or even residential project that I deal with in my practice. And one of the things that shows the difference is the fact that time was not of the essence. Although it was, but it was not a driving force. And it gave us a lot of time to go back and forth and back and forth. As, as I said, it took us 10 years from the inception until today. And we were going with, with and changing things. One of the things that stands out to me that it, it, I can contribute to the fact that we have a lot of time in the design of the project was, if you guys recall, there was a, a building here that was the sanctuary for a long time. It was a house that was converted uh, into the the uh, synagogue itself, and it's set on a hill. And every time I looked at the place, I said, well, how am I gonna take this huge building and put it on a hill, while my main goal, or one of them, was to make this building as handicapped, handicapped accessible as I could. And I came several times, and one day it dawned on me, I said, 
what are we fighting elevations? Let's go and raise the whole hill down, make it all level, and we'll have a very nice accessible building. That's what we did. So I contribute that to the time that we had to design the building. Um, the, the second uniqueness about this project, I'm, I'm talking about my standpoint, was the fact that I was given um, almost a free hand in full support to, to whatever I wanted to do. One exception, the rabbi came to me and said, I want to see curved windows, okay? He's laughing. But besides it, uh, he let me do everything. I really did everything on the building, uh, including even the mezuzahs, that are the main mezuzahs in the building. The rabbi said to me, you designed them, and I did. So it's, it's very unique in, in the, from the perspective of an architect to get this freedom, number one, and to be asked to do everything. It's, it, it used to be a practice many years ago that architects did everything. Today, you know, you have interior designers, a building designer, an architect, the interior designer coming in. And another unique thing was that there was no design by committee here. The committee was one person, it was, it was him. And I have to tell you that his understanding of things that amazed me, I mean, how he understood mechanical, um, civil side, sight, it, it grasps like lightning. It's just incredible. So I was, I was blessed to work with, with, with Rabbi Hershey. Um, Okay, um, let me do the following. I would like to thank, first of all, the Chabad community for your patience and appreciation to my work and your support. And I would like to thank the city of Jones Creek, the zoning department, the building department, the fire department, for their support and encouragement. I would like to um, thank my office for dealing with my switching in the office. Um, every time we need to do something on this particular project, I stopped everything and said, you guys, Chabad now. And everybody stopped what he was doing and jumped and did it. Um, I would like to thank also my consultants, um, the, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, Tim and Mike, uh, my structural guys, Mike and Dan. They don't only, they did only do provided uh, a good job, but they also were very generous with their fees, so I have to really mention that too. Uh, and thank you for all that. And, and um, the contractor, uh, J.K. Lockwood, I would, I, I just, uh, amazed by their attitude and their strive, striving for perfection. Um, they didn't let go until we got it right. They moved things, they did it again, just to make sure and you could see it. I look, to the, I look now at the details, incredible. Just really incredible. So really unbelievable. Um, a, um, and I would like to recognize another person here, and he's, I think he's still here. Yaakov, are you here? The lighting guy? Our lighting consultant, not only that he helped us in the lighting design, which if you come at night, you'll see the, and Shuli, Shuli too, Shuli is here. Yeah, thank you. Not only that they helped in the design, and if you come at night, you'll see the, the fruits of what they did, um, but also um, the dedication, the patience, and I, I wouldn't, I, I, they came, I don't even know how many times they came, to make sure that everything works correctly. They also did the lighting control and it was pretty complicated stuff. So I know they're very, the details I'm talking about, but they're really important details. So, um, last and not least is the rabbi again. Thank you for your confidence and understanding and respect. And I have to say that we were on the same page all the time. I, I don't recall uh, any questions from him except one time the blue color so I came up with this scheme of you see it in the building the very dark blue and it was kind of shocking and the rabbi said to me I don't know about that one you know maybe we'll go to the light blue and I said you know what why don't you test it let's let's paint one piece the light blue and see what you like 
And he came back to me and said, Ari, you know what? I think this is the way to go. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I would also like to thank the Rashid's family also, and, and the Rabbi's family to, for making me part of their family. And um, again, thanks for your absolute confidence in, in me and in the work I have done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I remember uh, a very couple of quick stories. When I uh, first became mayor, uh, one of the matriarchs of our community passed away. And I had never met her family before, and her son called me up and he said, I'd like you to participate in the eulogy of my mom. And I thought to myself, wow, I'm going to completely blow it for this family. I had that same sinking feeling as I thought about making comments here today, Rabbi. And then I started thinking about some other stories. And, uh, you know, the, uh, Ari said that uh, he thanked the staff of the city of Johns Creek. And uh, I want to thank them, too, because, you know, we all have a special relationship with the rabbi, right? Every one of you. He has my cell phone. And the thing that I worried throughout this project, especially given, you know, its stretched out nature in, in getting done, uh, was how many times would the rabbi call me? And what was I going to do when I received that phone call? And thankfully, thanks to a wonderful staff at the city of Johns Creek, I got very few of those phone calls. So I'm uh, very appreciative of that. I'm also appreciative of uh, the central theme of the rabbi's sermons. Anyone who's been here understands that uh, the rabbi always relates something or more than one thing in the last year that's happened in his personal life to prove what we all know, that God's hand is in everything. And Clearly, as we look at this, we know that God's hand is in this. So uh, congratulations to the family. The fact that we are here today with two other mayors, and I know in spirit with the other mayors of the six cities of North Fulton, also shows the reach of Chabad of North Fulton. Uh, when I started many, many years ago, it was referred to as Chabad of Alpharetta, which I thought was funny because it wasn't in Alpharetta. And, uh, and for those, by the way, who print the literature in the future, I will remind you, it's in Johns Creek. <laughs> Even though I told the rabbi I wouldn't push the Johns Creek thing. But, uh, but the reach is, is strong. And it's even stronger than, uh, than the great rabbi said to us earlier. And by the way, following rabbis is not easy. Um, it even reaches to the goys. And there are some here today. One of them is actually a member of my council. And I remember that he called me and he said, I've heard all about Chabad. And I, I don't know what it's all about. He was so compelled, he actually attended a service here just to see what it was all about. And I think that that actually speaks very much to the mission of Chabad. And it wasn't necessarily for him to change his belief system as much as it was for people to truly understand what we are all about. And in a time like today, the way the world is today, boy, do people need to understand what's happening. So thank you, Rabbi, for what you are doing for our community, what you have done for our community, and more importantly, what you will do for our community. You know, um, my father took me away from New York when I was 11 months old. So I didn't exactly get instilled the full New York thing. Of course, you've got it. And I appreciate that, because without that tenacity, Without that chutzpah, we wouldn't be here today. And so, um, you know, there's some adversity that came along the way. You found a way to ensure that that adversity would be turned quite around. And I'm so appreciative of that. So thank you so much, and may God bless this forever. I left out one very important thing. So Todd and Gabrielle, I want to say thank you. Uh, I remember when you, when you called me up and you said, you know, I'm going to be taking on this little mission. I'll need some help. I didn't give you much help. Uh, but you clearly got a lot of help along the way. Folks, we are still a little shy. I believe it's $750,000, right? So uh, this building can be debt-free. So I will say what others will not say. Please, if you uh, have it in you or know someone who has it in you, let's make this building debt-free so that this mission can continue. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Luna Bucket, or as I was previously known around these parts, Luna Zacon. And I live today in Arlington, Massachusetts. 
Why am I here in front of you today? Allow me to share with you a little of my background and all will be revealed. Growing up, I was a traditional Chabad Crown Heights teenager who had a simple and straightforward plan of action. I was going to finish school, earn a degree, and with God's help, get married and build a nice Jewish Hasidic family life together with my husband. While most things in life are uncertain, the one thing I knew for sure was that I wanted to be a professional, working woman that can come home at night and leave the workplace behind. The idea of working at or opening up a Chabad house was quite far-fetched and definitely out of my comfort zone. Granted, it is beautiful work and very admirable, something I was raised to appreciate all my life, especially as a gr girl growing up in Crown Heights, the place from where the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory launched the Chabad House Network. However, I envisioned myself supporting these special emissaries by having an open home for those visiting from near and far. Would I be running a Chabad house of my own? Not likely. Why? Because I enjoy my comforts, and it just seemed like the most difficult job in line of work, and one where you have no downtime and no personal space. Then something happened in my life. I spent a year in Rashi's house. I came with a friend, Sarla Diamond, to work for a year engaging in Chabad outreach as part of my schooling and was lucky enough to end up in Alpharetta. What I experienced that year was life-changing and is the reason why my husband and I today run our own Chabad house in Arlington, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. <laughs> what happened to me that year? There are certain elements that I can explain and many things that I cannot. It was an internal shift that happened due to one person. I met Rashi. I remember that within one day of, of arriving to Alfreda, Rashi made me comfortable and at home in only the way she could. By her force of nature, Rashi effortlessly juggled many elements in her personal and Chabad life. As an impressionable young woman, I watched and admired how Rashi made the mundane holy and how she had a way of making the holy reachable and real. Here was someone who let me know that running a Chabad house, reaching out to another Jew, impacting lives on the most soulful level, required one to be true to themselves, down to earth, and filled with life. So today, thanks to Rashi, I stand here before you and proudly announce that not only is there a new building in North Fulton in her honor, but there is also a thriving Jewish community in Arlington, Massachusetts, and in several other communities that are being led by what we call Alfie girls, the girls that got to spend a year or summer with Rashi and have the merit to carry on her tremendous legacy. Rashi. <laughs> Rashi, I know you are looking down upon us today, upon your family, your friends, and your community. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the everlasting impact that you had upon me. Well, I have the opposite beginning from Luna in life. I was brought up in a secular home in non-denominational, primarily Christian neighborhoods. Although I knew I was Jewish, I had no idea what that meant. Over the years, I attended a couple bar mitzvahs and one Shabbat dinner, all with cousins that I didn't know very well. But I had no feeling of Yiddishkeit. I was totally unaware. However, I always had a very strong pull or missing feeling in my life. It was some need that I couldn't define or put my fingers on. I had a vague idea that it was spiritual, spiritual and therefore started searching. I've always been around people who, if they identified with any religion, it was Christian, but in my gut I knew that wasn't for me. But I knew nothing about Judaism. Not the belief system, not their traditions, and not the customs. I felt very intimidated, but I did start exploring Jewish settings. Joining a temple was much too much of a commitment for me, and there didn't seem to be any available options for just dipping my big toe in. Then I found Chabad of North Fulton and their JLI classes. For the better part of two to three years, I attended every JLI class offered. I was so thirsty for the education. And at the same time, they were not requiring me to commit to something I was not yet comfortable with. 
I must admit, I felt intimidated by the Orthodox environment. I couldn't imagine attending services uh, in Hebrew, which I don't know, and I thought that the Orthodox members much, must be so devout, how would I possibly fit in? I did attend the education services for the High Holidays and a few other celebrations during this time, but I felt pretty intimidated due to my lack of experience. During this time, I kept thinking about Torah and tea, but it was at the rabbi's house. I didn't know Rashi, and I had a whole intimidation of orthodoxy thing going on in my head. And also, I am married to a wonderful, but not Jewish man, and I knew I was going to go through this journey alone. However, I just knew that I must attend. Thank God, Rashi. She was the missing piece of my transition. She reached out to me, made me so comfortable, and showed me what it meant to be a Jewish woman. I was at Torin T at the Minkowitz's home the night that Rashi passed. Her two young daughters welcomed us that night and said that their mother had a headache, was laying down, and that they would be leading the evening. We were making hamatashen. The table was laid out beautifully with all the ingredients and fillings. Since I never had made them before, I was the perfect student for the girls, who after demonstrating to the group, patiently gave me the extra direction that I needed. All of us ladies were having a joyful evening. There was a lot of laughing and talking. Two of Rashi's little ones also joined in in making, but theirs had extra filling. I clearly remember at the time thinking that even though Rashi was lying in bed with a headache, what pride she must have in hearing her young daughters confidently leading a Torah and tea meeting with, with all of his adult women, and also in hearing all the laughter and banter going on in the home. I still pray till today that she did hear that joy in the house that evening. I live in Gainesville, which is about an hour drive to here. I do not come as often as I should, but the effect that Chabad of North Fulton, Rabbi Minkowitz, Rashi and others in the community have had on me is profound. I no longer have this something is missing gnawing feeling. It has been replaced with a feeling of knowing. Although I still have not been to a Seder dinner, nor do I practice many of the Jewish custom customs, as I've never actually seen them performed, I do study the Torah, I light Shabbos candles, which is a mitzvah I took on in Rashi's honor, occasionally I go to services, and I have an ongoing conversation with God. One of the exciting things that I've noticed is that I even recognize many of the coincidences that Rabbi Minkowitz has talked about through the years. Those really excite me because I notice them and I realize that that's God working in this world. And as Rabbi Minkowitz says, once you open your eyes to these things, it becomes life-changing. I am one of the very few Jews living in the Gainesville area. I tried my best to represent the tribe. I wear my grandmother star of David always, and this has been a starting point of many conversations. Once the Walmart cashier said she was Jewish and asked if I was scared to be wearing my star of David in North Georgia, which as most of you know, has a bit of a dark history. I replied no, and even if I was worried, I would still wear it because I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm grateful that Hashem provided me with the teachers via Chabad of North Fulton. My life is much richer now, and I know, now that I know God and my purpose. I love that Chabad teaches the Torah as it is written and encourages us, encourages us to do our best to follow the Torah teachings based on where we are in life. Chabad of North Fulton's influence on me has helped me become a better person, become a more religious Jew, and has shown me the effect that I can have on others making the world a home for Hashem. Congratulations to all on bringing this day to reality. Thank you. Hello. Wow. Um, the mayor earlier talked about following rabbis. Now I have to follow rabbis and a mayor and these wonderful speeches. So I'd like to thank Rabbi Hershey first before I start for uh, extending me this opportunity. I'm really grateful. So my name is RJ Gary. I'm actually a student at UGA, University of Georgia, where I'm actively involved in Kabbalah. Even though I was born to a Jewish mother, I wasn't really raised Jewish. In fact, I didn't really have any religious beliefs present in my upbringing. 
I'd been made aware of my Jewish heritage as I grew up, and when I turned 13, I made the decision that I wanted to be more involved with Judaism. That decision prompted my mom to take me to various synagogues in the North Fulton area. After visiting many, the last we visited was Chabad of North Fulton, right here. After one service and a delicious Saturday lunch, I think I had cholent, it was the spicy one, it was really good. Uh, I knew Chabad was the place where I wanted to explore my Jewish roots. After coming to a few more services on Fridays and Saturdays, my mom and I spoke with the rabbi about how I could become a bar mitzvah. Given that I was well over the age at which this process normally starts, I was already well past my 13th birthday, he was surprised, but he immediately offered to help. He agreed to meet with me weekly to get me from unable to read Hebrew to reading the Torah, starting with Aleph and Bet. Of course, I was grateful for his help, but now, later, I realized just how big of a task that was to take on. A little over two years later, I was 16 and a half and finally having my bar mitzvah. We're here today on Rashi's fifth yard site to officially open her campus. She played a huge part in my bar mitzvah, allowing the rabbi to take the time to study with me and to learn for over two years. Her commitment to the North Fulton Jewish community can be seen in many places, and this community center represents the culmination and the continuation of that commitment. I know that most of us here can think of a time where we were positively impacted by the Minkowitz family and by Chabad. For me, finding a home at the Chabad of North Fulton helped me to, find, to have a home at the Chabad of Athens with Rabbi Refson and his family who are here today. I'm so glad, yeah. And now I still enjoy the green stuff that Hannah makes. So it's all about food for me. <laughs> I want to thank Rabbi Refson and his family today uh, for continuing to guide me down the path on which I started here. And I especially want to thank Rabbi Hershey and all the Minkowitz family for everything they've done for me. It's been an honor to speak here today, and I'll be forever grateful for the home that I have here in North Fulton. Good afternoon. It is a trend of late to make an effort daily to find things, big or small, to be grateful and thankful for. This is, as we know, something now very new in Judaism. Hakarat HaTov, being cognizant of the good that we have and expressing it. This dates back all the way to Moses in Egypt, and of course present in our daily prayer, our Jew recites first thing in the morning. Ani, thank you God for returning my soul. Standing here today, which happens to be just a few days shy of our second year anniversary in Chabad of North Fulton, I would like to take this opportunity to thank and be makatov, express publicly thanks and appreciation. So on behalf of myself and my wife, I thank Hashem for giving us the privilege to work with Rabbi Hershey and to be a part of this incredible community that he together with Rashi built with their warmth and dedication. The past few days I've been thinking about the, this monumental occasion the grand opening of Rashi's campus, the new home for Chabad of North Fulton. What struck me is a profound message from a teaching in the book of Leviticus, which we started to read last Shabbat and its connection to this very day. The book of Leviticus primarily discusses and focuses on the daily offerings in the holy temple of the Beit HaMikdash. There are numerous types of offering and various ingredients and spices. What is quite interesting to note is that on one hand, it is forbidden to add any honey or leavening, a leavening agent to an offering. Yet we must add salt to each offering. What is the difference between honey or leaven and salt? Why is one forbidden and the other obligatory? The answer lies in what they do to the other ingredients. Honey or leaven changes the food, one by making it more sweeter and the other fluffier, while salt simply brings out the natural flavor already found in the food. This teaches us a lesson, in, a deep lesson in life, and as I will connect it as well to us sitting here today for this special occasion. 
Each individual is charged with a mission in this world to serve God in the best and most beautiful way. It can occur to someone that in order to accomplish his or her task, they need to look outside of themselves, change or add something to their inherent qualities. This is quite the contrary. There is no need to add any honey or leaven. Each person should be aware that they have been blessed with the qualities they need to fulfill their purpose. All they need to do is to add the salt, allow those qualities to shine. Allow me for a moment to compare the community of North Fulton to a platter of food comprised of many different components. The strong, caring, and dedicated leadership of Rabbi Hershey, the vibrant and warm energy of the community, the joy and excitement of the children and youth, everyone having an integral part in this arrangement. So much has been accomplished already in this community. And now we are standing on the threshold of a new stage ready to, eat, ready to do even more. The magnificent Rashi's campus will be the salt to enhance and take all the strength and energies found in this community and bring it to the next level. I feel privileged and humbled that we get to be part of this journey and are, with God's help, looking forward to see what incredible things are, are to come. May each of you be blessed to utilize all your qualities to the fullest, and together we will truly light up North Fulton with goodness and peace. Everybody knows that a happy life is a happy wife, so now that you've heard from uh, my, my rabbi that I do most of my learning with and my very good friend, I would like to introduce the, my wife's rabbi and her very, very close friend. Rabbi Hershey Minkowitz. you're probably eager to get inside and eat. I know I am. <laughs> so I'm going to try to be brief. First, I want to just uh, say something. RJ, who spoke earlier, there's one thing in his speech that he didn't say. Maybe it was too emotional for him, but I want to say it for him instead. His bar mitzvah was scheduled for uh, the week, two weeks after Rashi passed away. When we came back from the shiva, and obviously I had to dive right back into my work. And the very first week we came back, because we did the shiva up in New York, and the very first week we came back, already I had to be performing, because I had to do a bar mitzvah that weekend. And it was, I remember it was a very difficult weekend to pull myself together and get back into that mode, to come back into shul like regular and lead a bar mitzvah. And it was RJ's bar mitzvah at the age of 16, but it was very inspirational because of the story. This was a kid that was self-driven, at the age of 13, 14, decided to get on his path of Torah and to be able to be there was the, it was the greatest way to integrate myself back into work. Sadly, this weekend, the weekend of the grand opening of the building, is the, was the first Shabbos after his mother passed away. She, she got sick a few weeks ago and she passed away suddenly. She was a teacher at the, at the middle school here at Taylor Road where we have a club actually, like a release time type of club, the JMS club there. And it's just ironic that he's here today sharing some words when literally the experience has crossed over. So just a couple of quick words and then we're going to go on to cutting the ribbon. Uh, I'm sorry, my son Mendel wrote a song in honor of the occasion and in memory of his mother. And he's going to sing it and then we're going to go to the uh, ribbon cutting. A couple of weeks ago, I heard a story about my grandmother that I never knew, my father's mother. My father's mother, my father's parents came from Russia. They were able to run away during the war, but they had a lot of relatives that were still in Russia under the time of the Soviet Union when it was illegal to practice Judaism. And they wanted to try to help them with religious articles or other things, but it was illegal. You couldn't send books, you couldn't send a show for you. You weren't allowed to send anything because they didn't let you practice. But Jews are smart. And they'd come up with these clever ways to try to send stuff. 
And it turns out, again, I'm now 46 years old, so I wasn't even around when you came here 49 years ago. And I just heard the story now, a few weeks ago, from my uncle. She, before the holidays in September, she sent her, I think it's her brother, who was still living in Russia, maybe her brother or her father, she sent them a tea set, a set of tea, tea bags, and with tea you have to have lemons. So she sent along a lemon also, but the lemon wasn't a lemon, it was an esrog. They needed an esrog for the high holidays. It's a true story, and that's the way she was able to smuggle an esrog into the country so they can practice their religion freely, not freely, but practice it and have the tradition. And the reason why I thought about that story, because I thought about, wow, look at what a difference 60, 70 years makes. We don't have to smuggle esrogs in, in tea sets. And we don't have to bring in a mohel to be in a cellar to do a, a bris, a ceremony. We're in America. We're in the land of the free. We're very fortunate. We can build large shuls. They can sit right on the street. And you can proudly pull up here and come to a service, come to study. You're not doing anything illegal. There's no one after you. We should cherish that. We should understand that. And as we celebrate this building, really commit ourselves, as the rabbi spoke earlier, filling this place with Torah and with continued Jewish practice. You know, I heard somebody once say that when we were kids, we would go visit our grandmother, and I say we, the collective we, and our grandmothers would show us pictures of their upbringing. And they'd take out like this little box out of the closet, and you'd look at the pictures and you say, Grandma, what's this? Oh, this is, you know, when we had the one wedding in the shtetl and everyone got together and Uncle Chaim came. And what's this? You know, this is the time when we got to go on a, what they called a vacation in those days. They went down to the park where they had a little swing and this was your father when he was a little kid. And this is what we do, when we, that's what we did when we visit our grandparents. What are our grandchildren going to do when they come to visit us? So it's not going to be a box anymore. It's going to be something like this. And we're just going to... With our finger, that's great, but then they're going to ask, and what's this? This was my venti Starbucks on Monday morning. <laughs> and what's this? Oh, this was our falafel at, at, uh, at f Famous Pizza, whatever the, whatever the place is called, you know? And this was me standing, oh, this is my selfie here, my selfie there. This is the history that we're creating for our future, are all sorts of inconsequential, superficial things that there's going to be the legacy that we're going to show to our grandchildren? No. This is the history that we're creating for our children and our grandchildren. <laughs> continuing to build... <laughs> continuing to create real history about what it means to be devoted to Torah, devoted to mitzvahs, devoted to Hashem. Creating a history. I was here, we were part, we got together, we went through a difficult time. We rallied together anyway, we were going to continue a community, we built a shul, we started attending, we started coming, we brought friends. That's the story we want to be able to tell. Take selfies of yourself inside the shul, at a class, bringing your children, dropping them off at Sunday school. Create real good memories. We shouldn't need them because we should be blessed, of course, with the Mashiach coming, the Messiah coming, the redemption, so all this would be a part of the past anyway. But we should also keep our mind on creating real-life legacies of tradition and values, and this is what we are celebrating here today, a place where it could all actually happen in a real way. Last week, I, my sister married off a child, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, they're, they're here, and I have the good fortune of being in New York for the wedding, and now that we have another rabbi, I was able to stay for the weekend, and I'm glad I did because I heard a story Friday night at the Sheva Brachas, which is the follow-up parties after the wedding. I heard a story, and this is what I want to share with you. And I think that the, the uh, grandson of this person might be in the audience today. Those of you that have kids at KSU, you know Rabbi Zalman from Chabad at KSU. So this is the story that I heard. I, I assume he knows the story too, and he can verify if it's true. When his father, when Rabbi Zalman's father decided that he wanted to go move out to open, to do Chabad outreach, he was going to become a rabbi, and he moved to Winnipeg, I think it was, somewhere in Canada. And his father, that means Zalman's grandfather, went to meet with the Rebbe. And he says to the Rebbe, he's very disappointed that his, that his son is taking up this profession. Because 
There's no money in that job. You have to, you know, he wants his kids to have make earn a good living to be able to live comfortably, like Luna described earlier. And that's not something that is really going to give him a good future. So he's very disappointed. He's worried about his son going into this line of work. So the Rebbe said to him, I don't understand. You're like a little bit hypocritical because you're a rabbi. <laughs> you're also in that line of business. So if it was good for you, why can't it be good for him? So he says, yeah, but you don't understand. I had a father. He happened to have a rich father. I had a, a father. The father took care of me. So the Rebbe says to him, okay, so your son also has a father. So he says, yeah, but I don't have the means that my father had. My father was a rich man. I don't have the means. He says, I wasn't talking about you. Your son has a father. Avinu Sheba Shemaim, our father in heaven. The same God that took care of you through your father will be there for him through whichever channel it's going to happen. And that story, when I heard it last Friday night, that went straight to my core because I thought that that really epitomized and really took, brought it all into one simple statement about what happened for our community from the beginning of time, but surely in the last five years. And that's my message to you today. How did all this happen? Because we all have a father. We have our biological father and mother. We have our spiritual father, which is Hashem. And Hashem makes everything happen. He pulls all the strings. He orchestrates, he coordinates all the happenings of our life. He coordinates and makes happen. Sometimes we understand why it happens in the way it does. Sometimes we don't. But one thing is very clear. We all have to always remember that Hashem guides every step of man. God guides every step of man, everything that happens in our life. As he said, the good, bad, and the ugly, the things that look not to be good, it's all Hashem. And when we have a Venus of Hashemayim, when we have our Father in Heaven, everything just works out. How does it happen? Hashem has many different angels through which it unfolds. Today, we celebrate a culmination of this project, and we give thanks to Hashem for giving us all the gifts that He did through all the messengers that he chose. Who are those messengers? Who are those messengers? The messengers are every single one of you in this community. When we went through our experience five years ago, and we didn't go through it five years ago, we continue to go through it till today, the way the community rallied to our side, the commitment from everyone that we knew, the active ones, the inactive ones, the ones you see in shul, the ones that you see at the high holidays, the ones that I know privately during the week that I'm spending time with, the people and the way you all responded to make to being committed to ensuring that the legacy continues. I have a little secret for you. It really wasn't you either. It was Hashem acting through you. You had the ability, you had the good fortune to be an emissary of Hashem acting through you. Hashem... Sent, sent us a connection to our architect who wasn't, he's a little humble. I still didn't get the bill for the phase one, by the way. Forget about phase two. The Mikvah project bill didn't come yet either. God sent us another angel, a good friend who unfortunately is not able to be here today, but he sends his greetings. A man named Joe Lipsy, who I had the good fortune to get to know 20 years ago, a few weeks after I moved here. And he was one of the angels that made this building happen. Committed heart and soul and threw his whole life into making sure this happens from behind the scenes. That no one needs to know just to make sure that this building will be there so that our community can have a place where we can continue Torah Judaism in the North Fulton area. We're very grateful to him and we wish him a bracha, a blessing for success in all areas of his life in the places that he needs it most. Him and his wife Shira, I give great gratitude to them and thank them for being one of the angels through whom Hashem worked to make this happen for us. Mike Levin, another individual who is a, a, a legend in the world, in the Jewish world of Metro Atlanta, who is another person who I had the ability to become close friends with many years ago, early on, thanks actually to Melissa Miller and Mark. This is a relationship that they started for me. Um, 
I want to thank God for him being one of our messengers and for being one of the pillars of making this building happen. Anthony already mentioned Todd and Gabrielle Starr, my partners who uh, was an absolute delight to be working with. Mayor, his cell phone number I have and I use very, very, very often. So you can thank him because he, everything gets deflected onto him instead. I want to also thank Michael Morris who, again, by the, by the graces of God, he lived right down the street when I moved here and I had the ability to develop a relationship with him which then led to many other relationships and I want to thank Hashem for him and thank him for everything he's done for us and for the larger community. I want to thank Maris Vandergrift. Maris is a woman who's very humble and shy so that's, I'm just going to say five words but I want to thank God for putting her in my life, putting me in her life and for her offspring that she brought to this world and Hashem should bless her with good health and happiness forever and that the, one of her values is Midor Lador that whatever she learned from her parents she should pass on to her children which she did and they should be able to pass it on to their children and it should continue for many more generations to come. <laughs> Yaakov mentioned the lighting guys, Sh Shuli and Yaakov, they really deserve a tremendous honorable mention and I want to just mention them as well. I mean, the poor people, they thought they were selling some lights to a shul, and little did they know, little did they know, the amount of days that they spent, the amount of nights that they spent here, forget about days, because lighting had to be tested at night, and uh, this was a job that doesn't end at 5 o'clock when you get caught up in a Chabad project. So I want to thank them very much. Um, there's a lot of, there's a really, really a lot of other people, but I, I know I don't want to hold you up in the heat, so let me just, a couple of things. Number one, today I was very touched because, to a great surprise of mine, about 15 of my classmates, former classmates from school, showed up here. I only knew about three or four of them coming. So that was a real, real, real treat. I mean, led by, led by the support that I've had, the moral and emotional support that I've had from my two primary friends, Shmuley and Yossi, Shmuley Stern and Yossi Sternberg, uh, who, as I said, by the who showed up the night when Rashi passed away, when we arrived in New York, they showed up at the airport and have not left my side uh, uh, it, it, since then. But then all my other friends that came in the, today, that really, really, really touched me. It was very, very emotional to have you here. And most importantly, Rashi's parents, who are by far the most amazing people that you could ever imagine to meet in your life, the way they have dealt with the whole challenge that you know tragedy and everything we that we experience and the way they continue to handle it and the level and the depth of support that they give not only to my children who are their grandchildren but to me and to many people in this community they become close to is just something that can't be described in words and I take this moment to give them a, a tremendous yashakayach and bless them that Hashem should give them uh, the strength and the ability to continue being who they are. And then of course my parents as well. You all know this about me and I'm not ashamed, unashamedly, I am a mama's boy. I speak to my parents multiple times a week. I don't make any big or small decisions without asking them. And if I don't ask them, my father has a way to find to let me know his decision anyway about how it should be. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, my, my own siblings, uh, my, my brothers, my sisters, Rashi's siblings, just uh, if you have to go through a difficult thing in your life, which of course no one should have to, but if you have to, you're lucky and you're blessed if this is the circle that you're connected to. So I want to thank them. Okay, it's always nerve-wracking when you have to make a speech and there's people to thank, and I'm sure I left out a lot of people, so uh, maybe Kim could put out like a complaint box or something, but really don't. Don't, don't take it personal. I just know you've been sitting for a long time and we didn't think the program would go that long. I want to just tell, I want to talk to all of you now, my dear friends from the North Fulton, from the Metro Atlanta area, this is what I want to end with. And from anyone else from the community here. In the Talmud, there is a discussion that says that they once asked one of the rabbis, for those, we have a lot of Torah scholars here, so this is in Yuma, Daf Tesamud Beis. You have to know the site, the, the page and the, and the line number. They once asked one of the great rabbis in the Talmud, which of the temples was greater? 
Because, you know, we have the Western Wall in Israel that's a remnant after the temple was destroyed, that the wall is left. But that's the second temple. When we got to Israel, we built one temple. It was up for 410 years. It got destroyed. We rebuilt it 70 years later. And that one was up for 420 years, so 10 years more than the other. And then that one got destroyed. And then we went on into exile. We've never rebuilt the temple since. Now we have temples in every community. So the question was... Which one is greater, Rishonim or Achronim? The, big, the first building or the second building? Which one is bigger? Which one was greater? And the rabbi gave a three-word answer. And this three-word answer is what I want to leave with you today as I introduce Mendel to come sing and then we go to cut the ribbon. And he said, if you want to know which building is the greater building, for those that speak Hebrew, we have a lot of you here today, to new Einechem Babira. You want to know which one is greater? You have to look at the building. What is that supposed to mean? They were almost identical buildings. What does that mean? Look at the building. And what this means is, and this is the charge to all of us, eh, the nicest Chabad house, the second nicest, I don't care if it's the hundredth nicest. In fact, I wish every single one of my colleagues ends up with all the angels that we ended up with in the last couple of years and build centers that are 50 times bigger and nicer. The question is, what is greatness? And to define if what's the greater building, you have to look at what goes on in the building. It's not about the four walls, although we're extremely grateful that we have those four walls, the magnificent four walls. It's going to boil down to what goes on inside that building. So when the question is going to be asked, which one is nicer, tell me about that new building that they built in North Fulton, we are the ones that now are responsible to create the answer for that question. Because the answer is going to be, look at the building. Look at the building. Tell me what goes on over there. Is it a place? Bridget, I have to tell you, Rabbi Kaplowski put me on a guilt trip now. You've never been to a Pesach Seder. So it's not the most beautiful building yet. Come, we're having a public Seder Friday night, Mar April 19th. This is going to be, we are the ones that have to answer that question. What is the greatness of the building? What's going to go on inside that building? And that, I, I'll show up to work. And in fact, if I show up to work, I'm also failing because in the Chabad world, I'm supposed to be out on the street bringing more people in. It's really all up to you. I beg you and I encourage you to show our gratitude to God by turning this building into what it should be. It should be a house and a place where, number one, any Jew from any walk of life always feels comfortable coming. There shouldn't be the stigma, there shouldn't be the fear, there shouldn't be the apprehension. And it should be a building where when you come, you should want to come back a second time. And when you come there, you walk out of there, you feel inspired. I learned something today. I grew. I, I, I did another mitzvah. I got closer to God. I felt spiritual. It's all going to depend on you and on us. It's a partnership. Yes. We have to provide the teaching, then you can start teaching each other, but this is going to be the answer to the question. And that's what I leave you with. Tanu Einechem Babira. Help us answer that question of the greatness of the building. Let's demonstrate to ourselves and to the world. Let's create that history so we're not showing selfies of our Starbucks and our platters of food in our future. Let's tell stories about how we helped build another center for spirituality, for Torah, and for Judaism to thrive. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, by the raise of hand, uh, who has a struggle in belief, in the word belief, who struggles Believing in something by the raise of hand. Okay. For the past five years, I've personally been struggling with having belief, um, in belief in Judaism, belief in in uh, in God, belief in in the in uh, the reason, the fact that I have to face the fact that my mother wasn't with me every single day, um, and I still struggle with those things every single day. But the reason how I coped with the loss of my mother was through music. And I live in Brooklyn, I live in my grandparents' house. 
Um, don't ask how that is because uh, music can't be played after 5 p.m. Um, but uh, I make it work. Um, I have a friend that came with me all the way from Brooklyn just to support me. Uh, my friends are a very big part in the fact how I'm able to get through my day-to-day -day life in Brooklyn without my parents there. Um, and I would like to dedicate this song. It's called I Believe. I released it yesterday. I'd like to say that um, a record label, Sony Records, uh, approached me last week and they called me and they, uh, thank you. Sony Records called me last week and I had a meeting with them in the city in Times Square and they, they wanted to know if I was going to be able to work on Sh Shabbat and I said no and it, they, we made a lot of complicated situations by the uh, office and so I just decided instead of just sitting here and wasting my time I'm going to wait for the next opportunity because my father always told me don't take the first opportunity so uh, here's, here's, this is the song called I Believe Just a game was like that yesterday. Caught in the pouring rain, I picked myself up. When times are rough, there's so much to say. It's hard for me to explain. I just had enough. I'm not giving up. going to have the procession where we march the Torahs. We're going to, we're going to pick the Torahs up over here. So um, the gentlemen that are asked to please um, carry a Torah if they're at this door over here.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready for the ribbon cutting and the hanging of the mezuzah on the shul. Henya is going to represent all the children with a short speech right before we cut the ribbon. Right before we put the mezuzah. In the year of 2014, I lost someone who was very special and important to me. I lost my mother. I will vividly remember that, that day as if it were just yesterday. It was quite a normal day until my mother was feeling sick and had gone to lie down. We all thought that she had a little virus and she would be feeling better the next day. So we went on with our day and then went to bed. The next morning, I was woken up by my neighbor, Jeanette, pulling on my arm and telling me to go to her house. I got to her house, sat down on the couch, being very confused, and saw the rest of my family sitting beside me. My father walks in and slowly approached us to say, Mommy went up to Hashem. My face immediately, immediately went pale. I never would have imagined to hear those words come from anyone, especially my father. The room was quiet and everyone had the same expression on their face. Tears started rolling down our faces and those tears then turned into loud, scary cries. Why did this happen? Why did God choose us to do this to? As the night went on and the tears kept falling, my thoughts began to erase my mind. How will we survive? How will Tati be able to show a smile on his face after something like this? As I grew older, I learned that no matter what happens to you, you can push through it and you can break out that little smile. And you can keep going on with your life and push through all the struggles you're going through. I learned this from seeing how hard my father works to keep our community going. My father always has a smile on his face no matter the situation. When he sees something that needs to be done, he will do it without a question. I don't understand how someone can be so motivated and so strong after such a terrible tragedy. My father inspires me to keep going, to keep pushing through everything I'm going through, and to go on with my day with a smile across my face. There's a reason for everything. Some may not make sense to you, but everything that happens in your life happens for a reason. And you should know that no matter what happens in your life, there's always someone who loves you and there's always someone who will be there for you no matter what. We're gathered here today to celebrate the grand opening of our beautiful show as a dedication to my mother. It is amazing how far we have come and how big this community has grown throughout the years. The feeling of being in a building that was built in honor of my mother feels so incredibly special. Everyone that is a part of this community has a special place in my heart and you should all know that my mother is looking down on all of you and is so proud of what we have become. Thank you very much. Rashi's father will now place the front mezuzah on the shul. He will make the bracha. And then I'm going to say shahachiyana, which also includes a new suit and tie that I'm wearing today. Baruch Ata Adinoi Eleheinu Melech Ha'olam Shehachiyanu V'Kiyimanu V'Higiyanu L'Zman Hazeh We're now going to ask the eight children First they're going to pose with their scissors uh, cutting the ribbon, open up your scissor because they want to take a picture and then on the count of three they're going to cut the ribbon and everyone is invited inside we're going to dance the Torahs into the ark and then you'll have the lavish lunch Girls, which way? Gentlemen, one, two, one, two, over there, one more look at, look at David, there you go okay, go ahead, cut, one, two, three, cut yay! <laughs> <laughs>
Full buffet lunch is now open. Washing for Hamotzi is in the two washing stations in the back. And they're, they're seating outside on the patio. You can take your food, seating is outside on the patio, and the building is open for self-guided tours throughout the day.
because it's now good school. I'm coming to Habat 15 years ago, and step by step, day by day, and week by week, month by month, years by years, and we are got now good, big school. God bless Hershey, Rabbi Hershey, and God bless all community, Anthony Shapiro, and Gidali Hertz, and we love them. Where they are good person, and they are anytime helping us, asking, and they are answering. And I hope more and more years I will be with them, with my family. Thank you so much. Mazel tov.